preliminar, we have spoken about her a lot this morning because she's a, a very important person in the field of hyperthermia. So I don't know if you are already there, Carrie. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you very much for the introduction. Great. Thank you. So she is going to speak uh, about an overview of oncothermia as a treatment modality for cervical cancer. So please, Carrie, okay. go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I am starting the screen sharing. All right, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Yes, yes, okay. it's okay. It's perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, first, Dr. Aryo, thank you very much for um, the opportunity and the um, very flattering introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, and also to the Scientific and Organizing Committee. It's, it's a real honor to be presenting my results amongst colleagues with um, such fantastic uh, levels of knowledge and, and experience. So thank you very much to everyone. Okay, I, we will be presenting some uh, more, some newer information on our, our cervical study in South Africa. Uh, we don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, this presentation will focus on modulated electrohypothermia or oncothermia for the management of cervical cancer. So I'm sure uh, as the audience is aware, uh, modulated electrohypothermia is a mild capacitive coupled heating technology that uses amplitude modulation. And cervical cancer and the treatments associated with cervical cancer um, are uh, associated, with, associated with significant morbidity. And this severely impacts the quality of life of patients, especially in the, the developing countries where um, sophisticated radiation techniques are not easily available. Right, in this presentation, we will summarize the literature on modulated electrohypothermia used for cervical cancer. I will also be describing a cost effectiveness analysis that we have done on the use of modulated electrohypothermia in both a private and public setting in, in a low to middle income country. And you will be having uh, or seeing a sneak peek of our three year survival data, which we will be presenting and, and sharing with you today as well. Okay. For the literature review, we searched for any papers on MEHT and, and uh, locally advanced cervical cancer. And for the three year survival, uh, the da data from our locally advanced cervical cancer trial were used and evaluated. And then for the cost effectiveness analysis, um, we will be presenting a study that we did in 2012. This analysis we did before we started the clinical trial. And as we didn't have any data at the time, we used um, the results from the Dutch deep hypothermia trial. And as you know, that included only radiation uh, with or without hypothermia. So in the 2012 analysis, the cost effectiveness analysis, we look at uh, modulated electrohypothermia with uh, radiation. And we look at it from a, a third party point of view. So an insurance medical insurance in South Africa, what it would cost them to include the, the treatments. And we reported in, in RANS, and it, we used a Markov model with the six-month cycle length. We used the same Markov model with the six-month cycle length for our 2021 results. And for these results, we used our three-year results from the cervical cancer trial that's ongoing. And for this evaluation, we looked at private healthcare as well as public healthcare. So what it would cost the government to incorporate into a state facility or a resource constraints facility, and also what it would cost in private healthcare. Okay, so results. The first paper on cervical cancer treated with, with MEHT that I'll present is by Professor Lee and colleagues from South Korea. This is a very interesting paper and gives us uh, uh, some excellent insights into the, the biological effects of, of MEHT on the tumors, especially cervical tumors. So 20 patients were evaluated with cervical cancer. They, they were treated with MEHT and the temperature, the peritumor temperature was measured during the treatment. Very interestingly, uh, Professor Lee and colleagues also evaluated the blood flow 
to the tumour um, before and during and after the treatments. Um, the temperature increases during the treatment. The temperature only increased by about one degree at 30 minutes and about two degrees at 60 minutes. So if we consider um, certain heating techniques require uh, a, a target temperature to be reached for 60 minutes or for a specific time. And if we had to um, aim for the same goal, then we would potentially have to be treating the participants for longer. So it would take 60 minutes to warm them up to the right temperature, and then potentially we should be treating them for another 60 minutes. However, Professor Lee also showed that despite the lower increase in temperature compared to other heating technologies, there was a significant increase in tumor blood flow. Now, if we consider the goal to be increased perfusion in order to improve oxygenation and, and increase the sensitization to radiation, then even though the heating was more mild, the effect was still, the, the, the desired effect um, to sensitize the tumors to radiation was still achieved. Of course, the previous um, paper excludes all the effects such as the uh, modulation and amplitude modulation and immune effects as well. So then Professor Lee and colleagues also published a paper on uh, previously irradiated uh, residual and locally recurrent cervical cancer patients treated with either platinum-based chemotherapies alone or combined with modulated electrohypothermia. And here is the list of different platinum-based chemotherapy regimes they used. MEHT was administered three times a week for a total of 36 treatments, which is a high number. Um, and they uh, reached a power of 150 watts. Patients were treated for 60 minutes. The MEHT, the addition of MEHT did not result in any uh, significant differences in toxicity, which is important. And then importantly, the overall response at uh, completion of treatment and at the last follow-up was significantly improved in the MEHT group. The overall response was considered a combination of complete response, partial response, and stable disease. So here you can see the MEHT group in, in both cases had a, a higher um, overall response rate. The authors also evaluated uh, survival, and although the MEHT group had a higher rate of survival, the survival rate was not significantly higher. Okay, and then the final paper on cervical cancer, um, or the final study, is our cervical study, our ongoing study in South Africa. We've published three papers so far, and I'll briefly go through them. Um, I'm sure, again, the audience knows it's reused sorry, we, we enrolled FIGO stage 2B to 3B participants. We included HIV positive participants. And a total of 271 participants were screened, 210 were randomized for treatment. Our protocol involved two MEHT treatments per week, immediately before external beam radiation for 55 minutes. And participants were also prescribed two doses of cisplatin. Okay, our first paper was on the local disease control seen at six months post-treatment. Local disease control was evaluated using a PET-CT study. And we saw in the participants that survived six months, 46% of the participants in the MEHT group versus 24% in the control group achieved a complete response of the tumor, local disease control. Because we used 2D um, planning and radiation was delivered to the whole pelvis, we considered, considered local control to be successful if all pelvic disease was re resolved. So if there were pelvic lymph nodes visible on the PET-CT scan, then local disease control was considered a failure. We did also evaluate only the tumor response on the PET-CT study, and when looking only at the complete, me complete metabolic response of the tumor, we saw 59% versus 36% of the participants in the control group had a complete response. Then when we evaluated the participants who survived um, and who didn't survive six months, so in other words, local disease-free survival, 
um, we had 20% versus 39%. So in all instances, the MEHT group had almost a double, almost doubles uh, the um, outcome compared to the control group. Then also important, our next paper um, evaluated the toxicity and quality of life of the participants. And we showed that MEHT did not increase the toxicity profile, even in the high risk, obese and HIV positive participants. And pain, emotional well-being, and physical function were significantly higher in the MEHT group. We also saw an abscropal effect. This is the third paper that we've published so far. Um, 54 participants in each group had uh, extra pelvic nodal disease on their pre-treatment FTG uh, PET CT study. And 24% of the participants in the MEHT group had complete metabolic resolution of all disease. And this was compared to 5% of the participants in the control group. So when we ran a multivariate analysis, the only variable that was statistically significantly associated with complete metabolic response of all disease was the administration of MEHT. Okay. Sneak peek of some of the newer results, which we um, will hopefully be publishing soon. Uh, we did present these at ESTRO as well earlier um, this year, or the, the last month. So our two-year overall survival was significantly improved in the MEHT group. Our three-year overall survival was also significantly improved. But the most, what we feel the most valuable result, the most uh, important result, is the disease-free status at three years. The disease-free status, if participants have a high quality of life and they are disease free, they're able to get back to their role functioning and uh, take pressure off the healthcare system and also off the community. So this should be the goal of any um, oncology treatment, but especially in a, in a system that's under extreme pressure. Our paper showed that we have an odds ratio of 2.4 um, in favor of achieving disease free status with the administration of MEHT. So this we were, this result we were most excited about. We also showed that there were no significant changes in late, uh, late toxicity in the MEHT group. And there were also improvements in the quality of life, which would make sense if the participants are disease free and um, not suffering from increased rates of, of late uh, toxicity. Okay, so the cost effectiveness analysis. Um, when we looked at the original study in, in 2012, looking only at MEHT plus radiation. So this was a, a theoretical model that we developed. Uh, MEHT dominated the model, uh, MEHT and, and radiation dominated the model compared to radiation alone. This means that MEHT was less costly and more effective. And these results in, in both studies were driven by the costs of progression, um, the high costs of progressive disease. Um, progressive disease and cervical cancer is very challenging to treat and, and very expensive. Our 2012 model showed that there's a 100% probability that the cost combination of, sorry, the cost of combination treatments is less than the cost of radiation therapy alone. Next, we looked at MEHT plus chemo radiotherapy. As I mentioned, this includes our current three year survival um, data. And um, participants for, for both studies, participants will move from either progression free survival to progression or to death. And the patients incur costs during the first cycle of the treatment, and then further costs are incurred as they progress through or, or, or yeah, as, they, as the disease progresses. The healthcare model showed that MEHT plus chemoradiotherapy dominates versus CRT alone. Um, this is again very important. So the participants had more health benefits at lower costs to the government and the probability of this model being accurate is 82%. Okay, from the private healthcare perspective, we had the same outcome with MEHT plus CRT dominating the model, with the probability of this being cost effective 
every time of 77.7%. And importantly, this is at no additional cost. This is represented by an isoplane, which um, indicates the qualities and the costs. So this would be an increase in cost or a cost saving. And we can see that we have in both instances a cost saving. So to conclude, um, MEHT combined with chemotherapy for the management of resi residual or recurrent disease significantly improves local disease response. MEHT plus chemoradiotherapy significantly improves local disease control, as well as three-year survival and three-year disease-free survival, without increasing the toxicity profile and with improving the quality of life of the participants. And very importantly, whether in a private or public setting, in, in at least a public setting in our resource constrained environment, um, the addition of MEHT is more effective and less costly. So future perspectives. Following this review, um, we feel that MEHT should be included in the guidelines for the management of, of cervical cancer. And consideration should be given to developing studies on MEHT combined with immunotherapy. Um, and this, we believe, is, is especially important following the abscopal response that we saw. And a detailed cost effectiveness analysis is being done with our three uh, new three year survival data. And hopefully that will be published soon as well for everyone to view. And I would like to acknowledge our statistician, Dr. Innocent Maposa from the bioethics department at our university, as well as the staff at the hospital involved in the treatment of the patients. And most importantly, we would like to thank the patients who come for treatment every day. They come to their follow-ups, they fight fiercely and bravely despite all the hardships that they face on, on a daily basis. And then also just to declare that Oncotherm supplied the EHY 2000 plus for research purposes and thank the National Research Foundation of South Africa for funding the study. So I would like to thank you all for listening to the talk. And again, thank all the colleagues in the organizing committee for this opportunity. If anyone is interested, these are the references. Oh, great, great, Gary. Your presentations are always wonderful and your research is always wonderful also. So. Thank you so much uh, for that, because I think uh, you are speaking about very important things. One is survival, local control. That for me is, and for us, is the most important thing because you are changing uh, the prognosis of your patients. So congratulations for that. But uh, also you are uh, speaking about a uh, cost, the cost of the treatment, which is very important in your country with you don't have a lot of resources, but also in more developed countries, because when you want to do any treatment, everyone is asking all the time how much is going to be the treatment and, and, and if the, the treatment is cost effective. So clearly it is. So I think your research is really, really wonderful. So, so thank you so much. I have a, one little question uh, regarding the question they asked me before about if uh, you prefer doing radiotherapy before or after hyperthermia. Do you have any opinion about that? Yes, we do. Uh, initially, we decided to do the hyperthermia before radiation purely for logistical reasons. Um, the, the pro protocol was approved in 2013, so it was, it was a while back. Since the publication of Professor Lee's um, work on, on the perfusion, we now feel that it is better to do uh, the milder heating techniques before radiation. And we always irradiate within half an hour of the patient completing hypothermia. And, and the reason being, we want oxygen in the tumor at the time of radiation. And because we're not heating to very high temperatures, we're not very likely to be slowing down the DNA repair mechanisms that, that occur post-treatment. So although in, in cases where we have, sometimes we have patients who are being treated far away and they come to our facility for the hypothermia, but they're receiving radiation elsewhere. In those instances, we do still accept them, but then we treat them afterwards. It's not the ideal protocol but we still see positive results. But yes, our, our official protocol here, our decision is 
to, to do the uh, MEHT before radiation. Okay, thank you so much for your experience. So uh, we have uh, several questions, so be ready because <laughs> <laughs> the first one is from, from Pyrus. So uh, if you want to, to uh, ask something, I, I, I think he's saying congratulations. Ah, so sorry, he's saying he, he needs to leave and congratulations to you. So let's go to uh, Gian Maria Fiorentini. He wants to ask you something. So please, if you are there, you can ask your, yourself. Okay, while he, he comes back, if he comes, uh, he's asking how many fewer radiotherapy sessions are performed when you use modulated electrohyperthermia. So uh, how many sessions do you decrease radiotherapy with when you combine? We didn't, it, for this study, we didn't decrease the radiotherapy um, protocol at all. So it's a standard radiotherapy protocol. Participants received 50 rays external beam in 25 fractions with three um, doses of HDR. So it's standard protocol completely. Um, the only time we reduce the radiotherapy protocols in our facility is when we re-irradiate. So participants with disease in a previously irradiated region, we have several hypofractionated protocols that we use. Um, and in those cases, yeah, I think we, we use the AMC or the, the, the BVI protocols. And sometimes we use a palliative protocol as well. Okay, and when you re-irradiate the patient, do you use a uh, hyperthermia uh, two times a week, three times a week? What do you do? Oh, always hyperthermia twice per week. Um, and uh, if, if the patient is having palliative treatment and only 10 fractions, then if we can squeeze in a fifth treatment of hyperthermia, um, logistics permitting, then we do as well, but minimum twice per week. Okay, great, great. So, uh, uh, Professor Van Gogh is asking also, I don't know if he wants to, to speak. Is, if he... uh, yes. Um, so, I think it's very important to, to work on this CALIS and the cost. As a part of the we showed to um, a company, um, an insurance company, and they said if you if you want to plan a continuous treatment, as we discussed before, so in fact we aim uh, to, to do modulated electrohyperthermia as a chronic treatment, because if you stop patient might relapse, so it's, it's in fact keeping the thing going on. Then he said from this point of view of an insurance company, this is not interesting, because the better you work, the longer the patient lives, but the more the insurance loses money on such a patient. So that's not an insurance product that is attractive for the insurance companies. How do the people deal with this problem? Because I really have no answer at that moment. So thank you, <laughs> Prof. Frankel. It's an interesting question. We, um, our time horizon was three years. So for the cost effectiveness analysis, we looked at, at only three years because we have three years survival data. Um, but when we extended that time, if we used a hypothetical model and extended that time to 10 years or to a lifetime, the cost effectiveness decreased. Uh, the, the effectiveness was, was great, but the, the costs increased. And in those cases, the costs increased quite drastically in the AVHT group. And one would think that that is um, not uh, correct because if you are disease-free, you shouldn't be incurring costs. If you have disease, then you incur costs, perhaps retreatment or even uh, side effects, uh, late toxicity. But what actually happens is if the patient is disease-free and very healthy and lives for another 10, 15 years, then they incur costs from a heart attack or a car accident or something else. <laughs> so from that point of view, it does get very difficult. And the debate that we have to have with the insurance companies becomes an ethical debate. Because if they have to look at all of their treatments from a lifetime perspective, they wouldn't approve anything. And um, from the insurance company point of view, they should also take into account that if they have 
uh, an extended life of 10, 15 years, it's, it's healthy, they will still be contributing to the insurance for an extended 10 to 15 years. So um, the actuarial analysis <laughs> becomes far more complicated and, yeah. and honestly out, outside of our scope. Um, and unfortunately, they, in our experience, have a tendency to still throw that back in our face and cite that as the reason they don't want to, to reimburse. But, but my advice is just cite that back because it's, it's very unethical, in my opinion, for them to say that, um, given, as I said, that every treatment that is successful would extend the life and cause costs. Well, that's why I did not have an answer because I was really shocked. But they have a yes. lot of point of view. <laughs> yes, but this is not a biostatistical calculation. It's it's an actuarial sciences calculation, mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, not by clinicians or anyone who has any involvement in healthy people. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. If I may, also sorry, I I'm not sure. I didn't mention in the cost effectiveness analysis in our private healthcare model, we did use IMRT and sophisticated imaging techniques. So our private healthcare model, uh, the, the cost effectiveness analysis could be um, more in line with the international costs and, and guidelines. Okay, so thank you so much again, Carrie, for your wonderful presentation and research.